could a harsh or corrupt leader actually provide protection for you? How is it possible to be completely right and totally wrong at the same time? How do you respond to and overcome unfair treatment? You're about to discover some principles that can change the entire course of your life. There is nothing we have that God hasn't given. You see, God gave us grace. Submission deals with your attitude. It is easy to obey God when the sun's shining. There is a secret place under the shadow of the Almighty where there is liberty, provision, and protection. The following 12-part teaching series by John Bevere, along with study guide and a copy of John's book, Undercover, exposes the subtle yet rampant tactics the enemy uses to keep you from the promise of protection under cover. Do you realize that you can choose your own master? You can choose sin, or you can choose obedience. In lesson four, John Bevere continues his teaching, The Consequences of Disobedience. Welcome to lesson number four, and I want you to open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter. 1 Samuel 15, please. Now, let me say this. In our last session, what we talked about was Cain and Abel. We learned very clearly that Cain brought an offering that was disobedient. Abel brought an obedient offering. The result, God said to Abel, if you would do just what is right, he said you would be accepted just like your brother. But he said, God said, if you do not obey me, he said, sin lies at the door. We discovered there is a door in every person's life, and that door gives legal access to sin and demonic power. And that door is there whether you realize it or not. We learned what opens that door, disobedience, and we learned what shuts it closed, and that is obedience to God. Is that true? Yes. Cain, unfortunately, did not listen to God's wisdom. Cain persisted in his own way. Sin entered into his life in the form of hatred, anger, strife, resentment, jealousy. It eventually turned into murder, and this young man who started out serving God ends up murdering his own brother. We are going to look at another very similar incident found in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now let me tell you what's happening here in 1 Samuel 15. We have two major personalities. The first one is King Saul. He is the first king of Israel, correct? The second personality in this uh, chapter that is a major personality is Samuel. And if I can say it like this, Samuel is the senior prophet of Israel, okay? The scene opens up in first, uh, verse 1 with Samuel coming to the king, King Saul, and giving him the word of the Lord. Samuel said to Saul, Thus saith the Lord, I want you to go and gather your armies, and I want you to go attack the nation of Amalek, and I want you to destroy every man, every woman, every child, and as a matter of fact, every animal that they own, everything that breathes, put it to death with the edge of the sword. This was a command. Now, I want to make a very strong point here. When Samuel gave Saul that command, Saul did not look at Samuel and say, Are you crazy? I'm not going to do that. And turn and walk away. That's what we call rebellion. Nor does Saul say to Samuel, Okay, I'll do it, and then later on not do it because it wasn't important to him. We might call that disobedience. I want you to be fully aware this morning that Saul gathers his armies and they go attack the nation of Amalek. Saul kills tens of thousands of men, women, and children. As a matter of fact, I could be safe to say probably close to 100,000 men, women, and children. He also kills thousands of animals, goat, sheep, oxen, etc. But he spares the finest animals to give to the people that, so that they could offer animal sacrifices to the Lord. Are you with me? Saul kills hundreds of thousands of people, but he does something. He spares one man, and that is the king of Amalek. Why does Saul do that? Because back then, whenever you conquered a nation, for you to take that king of that nation captive was like taking a living trophy. Are you with me? Every time you saw him as a slave in your palace, he reminded you of your victory over his nation. Are you with me? Now, Saul does all this, and I want you to notice what God says to Samuel. Look at verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Now, God later goes on to say he has rebelled. Are you with me? Listen carefully. Saul has done 99.9% .9 of what he was told to do. 
When you kill all but one person, that is 99.99%. Amen? But God says he's rebelled, disobeyed. So this shows us something right away, that partial obedience is not obedience at all. As a matter of fact, we can go on to say that partial obedience usually and can end up be and usually is rebellion. But somebody says, why don't you look at everything I did do? Why do you have to look at the little I didn't do? Have you ever heard somebody say that before? Especially kids. Are you with me? Well, look at all the room that I did clean up. Just don't look at the part that I didn't clean up. How many times have we heard that one? But listen to me carefully. God is not that way. God focused in on what he didn't do. Because God says he's not obeyed me, even though he's done 99% of what he was told to do. Now, I want you to notice what happens. Look at verse 13. Samuel goes out to Saul the next day. Look at verse 13. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now, would you look up at me? Saul sees Samuel coming out the next day after this campaign, this war. And Saul goes running to Samuel and says, Praise God, Samuel, I've done everything I was told to do. Well, that's not what God said to Samuel the night before, is it? So how do we account for the difference in opinion here? God says he's rebelled, and Saul believes with all of his heart he's obeyed. The answer is found in our scripture that we brought up time and time again, James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word, not hearers, deceiving your own selves. Deception is when you really believe with all of your heart you're right, when in reality, in God's eyes, you're wrong. A person deceives himself. The reason Saul believed with all of his heart he really obeyed is because he did not obey the word of God. He was deceived. Deception entered into his life. Are you with me? Now, when deception enters into our life, I want to read to you straight from the book. At this point, the person may fall away from any semblance of godliness or more frequently, they continue with a form of godliness but live religiously under the curse of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what usually happens, folks. When people get into a pattern of disobedience, and let me say this very carefully, this was a pattern in Saul's life. This was not the first time he disobeyed. If you go back and you'll notice he had a pattern of it, and I have found that every time you disobey, what happens is a veil goes over your heart, and that veil is called deception. Do you remember the first time you sinned by, let's say, speaking out against somebody? And the moment you spoke out against that believer, you felt like a knife hit your gut. Remember that? Amen. Right? Your heart was tender to the Holy Spirit, right? You felt like a knife. But you went, well, what I'm saying is right. It's true. It's accurate. Well, you can be 100% right and be wrong. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. So a veil goes over your heart. It's called deception, right? Then what happens? You speak about somebody again, and now you don't feel a knife. You feel a pinch. Are you with me? But you go, but I'm right. So another veil goes over your heart. Then the next time you speak about somebody, you don't feel a pinch, you feel a tingle. But you go, but I'm right. Another veil goes over your heart. Then the next time you speak about somebody, you don't feel a tingle, you don't feel a pinch, you don't feel a knife, you don't feel anything. What's happened? Your conscience is now seared. When you sear something, it is beyond feeling. Are you with me? At that point... You are seared, and God will have to send a messenger to you, and usually it's a prophetic messenger. It could be a prophet, it could be a pastor, a teacher, or it can be a friend. And they will come and help you see the error of your way. That is why James says, let anyone who has shown some, anybody that has wandered from the truth, and somebody has come and shown him the way, he has saved that person from a multitude of sins. Are you with me? What I have noticed is that God has a three-step process. First of all, he tries to get your attention in your conscience. But if you have repeated disobedience after disobedience after disobedience, what happens is he has to send a messenger to you. If you don't listen to the messenger, then judgment comes. Remember what David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Let me tell you something. Hardship will come to people's lives. Affliction will come to people's lives because of not obeying. Are you with me? It is not God that does it. His protective hand lifts, and you see what happens is you are now a target for the enemy. And we're going to see that clearly. But what happens with people is most of the time they still have a form of godliness. They still come to church, but now they're living on the letter of the law. They're living based off of the principle of reasoning, not off the principle of obedience. Are you with me? And so now listen to what, listen to what else I said in the book. 
His sense of right and wrong is now drawn from a source other than the Word of God breathed by the Holy Spirit into their heart. They live by the deceived dictates of their heart. It could be the letter of the Scripture, which kills, or it could be what society deems as right and wrong. Either way, they are out of touch with the living God. Now the only way they can be reached is by God sending a prophetic messenger to them. Are you seeing this? Samuel is that prophetic messenger for Saul. Samuel comes and basically confronts Saul. And you know what Saul does? He says, but I have obeyed. And Samuel says, well, then what's the beating of the sheep? And what's the lowing of the oxen I hear? And Saul says, but it's the people. It's the people. They wanted to offer a sacrifice to God. Now, let me tell you when you're in real trouble. When you believe you can serve God through your rebellion, that's when you're in big trouble. I don't care if you can find it from the Bible. Saul could have found that from the Torah. And he could have said, but Samuel, I'm doing exactly what Moses said to do. He did not obey God. Let me tell you, I have learned people can find what they want to find in the Scripture. Amen. And that is how they enter into a perverted lifestyle because perverted means twisted. And that is when you take what God says and you twist it to your own advantage. I had the Spirit of God speak this to me one day. He said, son, do you know what a religious spirit is? And I've learned that whenever God asks me a question, he's not looking for information. Are you with me? In other words, some of you aren't getting it. I'm seeing your faces. God was not looking for me to go, yeah, I know what a religious spirit is. It's this and this and this. Oh, John, thanks. I really needed to know that. No, when God asks you a question, he asks you that question because you don't know the answer. Now, I've written on it. I've preached on it. I've, I've heard other men preach on it. I've read other men's writings on it. But when God spoke to me that few years ago and said, you know what a religious spirit was, I real quick said, no, I don't know. And the Lord spoke to me. It's... As soon as I said, Lord, I don't know, he said, son, a religious spirit is one who uses my word to execute his own desires. I will never forget that. And immediately Saul came to mind. Saul won favor with the people. He gave them those animals. And while they're offering those animals, I'm sure those people are going, wow, what a godly king we have. He always puts Jehovah first. He got that king so he could have a trophy in his house. Are you with me? So Samuel confronts him. He says, what's the beating of the sheep? And Saul says, the people. And then Samuel says, no, wait a minute, you, Saul. And he backs him right into the corner with the word of God. And then finally, watch what happens. Look at verse 22. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Everybody say obeying. Amen. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Can you say amen? Amen. Now watch this, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, those of you with the King James Version and the New King James Version, will you notice, please, with me, that in this verse, verse 23, the words is and as are in italic type. Do you see that? For rebellion is as, is as are in italic type, the sin of witchcraft. Now, the reason they're in italic type is because they do not appear in the original text. The translators added it for clarity. However, I went back to the interlinear Bible, I went back to the books that had the every single Hebrew word with every English word above it, and I found out this is not an accurate translation. Now let me tell you the accurate translation. Are you ready for it? For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Now, it's one thing to be like witchcraft. It is a completely different thing to be witchcraft. Now, to get an understanding of this, the Hebrew word there for witchcraft is the Hebrew word kwezim. It's spelled Q-E-S-E-M. And I went back and I studied out this word, and I found out that this word doesn't really implicate a kind of occultic practice. What it really indicates is the goal or the effect of witchcraft. Now, listen to me carefully. What is the goal of witchcraft? To control, you're saying it. Let's look in an extreme case. Why does a witch put a curse on somebody? She wants to control their life through demonic power. The goal of witchcraft is to control. So what God is saying here is rebellion is to be controlled. Are you seeing this? Now, this can operate either with people being totally unaware of it or be people in, in occultic practices or Satanists being totally aware of it. Are you with me? Now, listen. A few years ago, my wife and I came into a hotel room after a meeting one night. We flipped on the television. We were on one of the major networks. It was either NBC, CBS, or ABC. And they were having a special on Satanism. 
Now, when I saw that, I went to turn the, the channel because I don't care to get any information about spiritual warfare outside of the Bible. That's just me personally. But the Holy Spirit checked me and said, and I felt like the Lord said, watch this. They were talking about the number one commandment of the Satanic Bible. Does anybody in here this morning know what it is? Does anybody come out of the occult? What's the number one commandment? That's exactly right. The number one commandment of the Satanic Bible is do what thou will. And I remember when they said that, I just screamed on the inside of me, that's a perversion. What did Jesus say? He said, I did not come to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And then, when I was a youth pastor, we had a lot of occultic practices in the area where I lived. We had a town right outside of our city called Casadega, where, which means house of the devil, and they had seances there and witches and warlocks and all this other stuff going on there. And so there was a lot of kids that dabbled in the occult in our high schools when I was youth pastor. And a lot of them were coming to our, our youth services and getting saved. And so we started interviewing them, and we found out something. When these kids join witches' covens, do you know what their leaders tell them to do? The first thing they tell them to do is they tell them to drink, take drugs, commit illicit sex with one another, and steal. They tell them to break all the laws of God, society, and of their parents, and they teach them the more you rebel, the more power you get. But isn't that true? Rebellion is witchcraft. Rebellion is to be controlled. Rebellion opens up the door legally and gives Satan access. They do it because they want more power. However, it works either way. Listen to what the Bible says. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, New Living Translation. They, those leaders who encourage insubordination, promise freedom. Listen carefully. But they themselves are slaves to sin and corruption, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Living Bible. Don't you realize that you can choose your own master? You can choose sin or else obedience. The one whom you offer yourself, he will take you and be your master and you will be a slave. Listen to me, folks. What we live speaks louder than what we speak. You can confess I am a Christian till you're blue, pink, yellow in the face, but until you live it, your lifestyle speaks louder than what you speak. That is why Jesus comes along and says, most assuredly, John 8, 34, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Why? He opens up the door. The demonic power gets legal access into his life. Are you here? Oh. Samuel warns Saul, correct? He warns him. But Saul doesn't heed. He doesn't truly repent from his heart. Why? He says, Samuel, I've sinned, but yet now honor me. In other words, he's more concerned about being embarrassed than he is that he's hurt the heart of God. And you know what the Bible says right after this? The Bible says, the spirit of the Lord lifted and an evil spirit came. That door was open and that evil spirit came into his life and he caused Sam, listen, Saul to do things he never would have done in his own right mind. If you would have looked at Saul as a young man, remember when he was humble before he became king? If you would have looked at him and said, Saul, one day you're going to kill, you're going to murder in cold blood 85 of God's ministers, their wives and their children, in cold blood. He would have said, you're crazy, I'll never do that. Yet he did it. That spirit, that sin got access into his life and caused him to do things he never would have done in his right mind. If you would have looked at Cain when he was a young man and said, Cain, one day you're going to murder your brother. He would have said, you're crazy. Yet what did Cain end up doing? He gave legal entrance to sin into his life. Go with me to Numbers, the 23rd chapter, please. Numbers, the 23rd chapter. Remember, we are talking about in these last two lessons the consequences of sin. Some people foolishly think that they can disobey God and the temporary reward or benefit that they get out of their disobedience will outweigh the consequence. I hope that after you hear these last two sessions, you will say it will never outweigh it again and you will never, ever have a desire to disobey willfully again. I'm hoping that it puts the fear of God in you. Amen. We need the love of God and we need the fear of God. Can you say amen? amen? The love of God makes me want to run and jump in his lap. The fear of God has me approaching his throne with trembling and also saying as far away from disobedience as I can. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. We need them both. Numbers chapter 23, are you there? Let me tell you what's happening here in Numbers chapter 22, chapter 23, and chapter 24. There is a man, two men in these chapters again that are major figures. First guy's name is Balaam. Everybody say Balaam. Balaam. Balaam is a prophet. He's a prophet of Jehovah. As a matter of fact, 
His prophetic ministry is so powerful that it reaches the ears of kings. One king in particular who knew about Balaam was a king named Balak. Everybody say Balak. Balak. Now Balak was the king of the Moabites and also he ruled the Midianites as well. Now listen carefully. In Numbers 22 it opens up with Balak the king seeking to hire Balaam to come and curse Israel. Why? Because Moab and Midian were nervous. They knew Israel had destroyed the most powerful nation in the world, Egypt, and now they were camped on Moab's plains and they were concerned that what they did to Egypt they were going to do to Moab and Midian. So the king says, I got a brilliant idea. I will hire this prophet because I know whoever he blesses is blessed and whoever he curses is cursed. I will have him come and curse this people. Are you with me? Yeah. So Balaam consents and he comes. The next morning they go up to the high places of Moab and Balaam says to the servants of King Balak, I want you to build seven altars. They build seven altars. Balaam goes and opens up his mouth to give the oracle. And what he does is he ends up blessing Israel and not cursing them. King Balak goes nuts. He says, what are you doing? Balaam says, well, maybe we need to go higher. So they go another level higher. And they build seven more altars. And he opens up his mouth to curse and he blesses. The king goes, gets furious. He says, what are you doing? He says, well, maybe we need to go higher. Now this goes on four levels, all right? And each level he blesses them. And I want you to hear what he says on the second level. Look at Numbers 23, verse 23. This is one of his oracles. He says, for there is no sorcery. Everybody say, no sorcery. No against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. Now, can I communicate that in today's words? There is no witchcraft against the church, nor is there any divination against God's people. Let the witches chant their chants, burn their candles, do whatever they want. They cannot touch the church of the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 26, verse 2 says, Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. Listen to what um, David says in Psalm 64, verses 7 and 8. David is talking about people that were putting curses on him. He says, But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. So God will make them stumble over their own tongue. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is why Balaam, in one of his oracles, Numbers 23, verse 8, says, How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Are you with me? He could not curse them. Now listen, he goes up four levels, and he basically tells the king, I can't curse whom God's blessed. The king is furious of Moab, right? And so the king looks at Balaam and says, You know what? I was going to give you a lot of money. But you're not getting a dime, not even a penny. And he starts walking away furious, right? Now, Balaam wants the money, right? So Balaam goes, wait, 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 king, come back here, come back here. And the king goes, what? And Balaam goes, listen, I can't put a curse on him, but I can tell you how to get him under a witchcraft curse. And the king goes, how? Balaam said, it's simple. Send your women into their camp. Tell them to bring their idols. And when they begin to rebel and sin against God, they will come under a witchcraft curse because rebellion is witchcraft. See, folks, listen. Do you remember Jesus made the statement? Listen. Do you remember Jesus made the statement? Revelations 2, verse 14. Listen. He said that Balaam had taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Listen to what Moses said in Numbers 31, verse 16. Moses said, look, these women caused Israel, the children of Israel to sin through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. Everybody say the counsel of Balaam. What he did is he said, Balak, I can't curse him, but I can tell you through counsel how to get him under a curse. Get him to sin. Get him to disobey. Now, his oracles are finished at the end of Numbers 24. Are you with me? The very last blessing that he gives Israel is after Numbers 24. It's between 24 and 25. He gives the counsel. Now look at 25. Verse 1. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the peoples to the sacrifice of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Wow, would you look up at me? Do you know what happens as a result of this? 
a plague breaks out. And this plague, this curse of a plague, is breaks out, is so powerful that you know how many people die? 24,000 people. Look at verse 9. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Now, would you look up at me, please? Their disobedience brought them under a curse, right? What stopped the curse? You may guess this. Radical disobedience started it. Radical obedience stopped it. Look at verse 7. Now, when Phinehas, who was the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, in other words, this is Aaron's grandson, the priest saw it, he arose, because what happened? Watch this, verse 6. Let me let you see what's happening. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle. This guy flaunts his rebellion in front of Moses and the whole church, right? Watch what Phinehas does, Aaron's grandson. Verse 7, Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he arose from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man and the, of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through her body, so the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. Radical obedience stopped the plague. And you know what God said about this young man? He said, I will give him the covenant of my peace forever because he's radically obeyed me. Look at this. <clears throat> verse 10, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Verse 11, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel at my zeal. Therefore, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. And it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant, an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. How did he make atonement? Through obedience. How did Jesus make atonement through us? for us? Through his obedience. He was obedient to the point of death. Let me tell you something, folks. God loves radical obedience. Why do you think God says through the prophet Jeremiah, why do you think he says, where are those who are valiant for truth on the earth? It's easy to go along with the crowd. It's another thing to stand out and obey authority. Because let me tell you something. If you obey authority, you're going to be the minority today, not the majority. I'm talking about in the church. Galatians, the third chapter, please. Now, Paul is writing here in Galatians, the third chapter. He is writing to the church of Galatia. He is not writing to the city of Galatia, correct? Correct, church? Yes. All right. Listen to what Paul says. Verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Would you look up at me? Who has bewitched you? Now, do you know what bewitched means? It means brought you under a curse of witchcraft. Now, look up at me. He's speaking to the church. Somebody says, I thought there's no witchcraft against the church. There's no witchcraft to the obedient. That's right. Paul writes to this church and says, the whole church is under a curse of witchcraft. Look at what he says. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Would you look up at me? This is a specific incident that gives us a universal truth. Are you with me? The specific incident is this. God had revealed, clearly revealed, everybody say clearly revealed. Clearly revealed. To this church that you are saved by grace, not the works of the law. Now listen carefully to me. It's not what, the, what he has not clearly revealed to us, but it's what he's clearly revealed to us. That we come under a curse if we don't obey. Are you with me? That we open up that door if we don't obey. Here's what Paul is saying. The universal truth is this. What God clearly reveals to us that we willfully disobey, it brings us under a curse. Why? Because we open up the door. Folks, Jesus made a statement. Let me say this to you. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 30, he said, the ruler of this world comes. Listen, but he's found nothing in me. Why did he find nothing in Jesus? Because Jesus said, the next verse, as the Father has given me a command, so I do. We Christians must see beyond personality and honor the position of authority. When we obey men in authority, we're actually obeying God. 
That's next in Lesson 5. Does God know who's in charge? We trust this message has been a blessing to you. Messenger International wants to connect with you. For more information, visit us on the web at messengerinternational.org or contact our headquarters by calling 1-800-648-1477. In Australia, call 1-300-650-577. And in the United Kingdom, call 0870-745-5790. By the power of God, you will be transformed.